terms of the stuff, deadlines remain unchangeified. So, exam one, quizzes part two, March 1st. Exam two, quizzes part three, April 6th. Exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, April 26th. Exam five, head to the normal uh, final time. And again, to see if you uh, need exam five, once you've done exams one through four, all the quizzes you should do in the paper, you can uh, get the grade estimator, put 100% for that final, see if it makes any difference. And again, if you don't take the final, it won't lower your grade because if you haven't done, it's already scored as a zero. So you can't get any lower than that. For the paper, draft deadline April 4th, plus five deadline April 9th, uh, emergency deadline April 16th, 50% deadline April 26th. Upcoming meetings uh, tomorrow, 8.30 to 5, so welcome to the office, I'll be at several meetings. Uh, 21st, 4 to 5, that only impacts my office hours because depending where the meeting is, uh, I'll need some travel time to, to get there. And then on the 2.26, a meeting from 12.30 to 5, uh, that falls within our class, so no class on the 26th. Well, you can still have class, but not the class. <laughs> It won't be a class this day. Or could it? Maybe they have marks as you Okay, so last time we started looking at our good dead friend John Monk, who was English, said some stuff, and then died, and was of course still dead today. Before heading on to his new stuff, his new old stuff, or old new stuff, at the name of the critique of native ideas, anything about any previous stuff? He's more stuff. Okay, so as we saw, we saw last time, the basic idea of an eight ideas is you know, this picture going by. <laughs> That's what it was last time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, same thing. It's got to be consistent. So those who believe in eight ideas believe that in the mind, somehow, somewhere, are pre-stocked ideas. And I've always used the metaphor of, you know, today when you buy a computer or a laptop or a smartphone or a tablet, it already has a lot of stuff preloaded in the factory. So, Metaphorically speaking, obviously those are loaded in, but using metaphor, those would be like the any ideas. As soon as you like unpackage it, you don't have to put on stuff, there's stuff already in there. For the uh, empiricist, they reject any ideas, so they say the mind is a tabula rasa, a blind slate. Nothing in here, but what comes from out here through the senses. And so that's one of the big battles. Are we pre-stocked with ideas from the get-go, or do we have to get them in through the senses? Now Locke, being an empiricist, says that they, we don't have any pre-stocked ideas, so whatever we get has to come from out there, or has to be acquired through, through experience. Now one of his goals, as we saw, was this. Descartes was you know, like a super developer, it's like he's saying, if he was on like Kickstarter or something, he'd be saying, I need lots of money to like just bulldoze everything, you know, bulldoze it all the way down to bedrock and build it all up again. So it's going to be a huge project. And Locke is more modest. If he was doing a Kickstarter or something, he would say, I'm just going to be clearing away the brush, you know, out there with my machete and weed whacker. And among this brush are these filthy, filthy, innate ideas. They're like weeds growing everywhere. Got to get rid of those. And then the master builders, not in the Lego sense, but people like Newton, etc., can come along and once he's cleared them off, they can do the, the real work. So Descartes was proposing a radical innovation, carry down all the way to bedrock, building up, and Locke is, I'm going to clear away some of the, the bushes and clear that lot out, then other people can build. But of course he did build a lot of stuff. So one of his main opponents were innate ideas. Now, being thorough, before he was dead, but now he's thoroughly dead. He considered three main arguments or considerations as to why we don't have any ideas. First is this. If there were innate ideas, his claim is, then we would expect to have this universal agreement. But he says, he gives an alternative explanation. So what a person who believes in ideas might say is, look, we have all these things and all these you know, cultures across history. They must be built in. Locke's alternative explanation is this, that we have this universal agreement, not because ideas are you know, baked in like chips and a cookie, 
but people have similar experiences. So for example, we all have the idea of the sun, not because it's innate, but because we see the sun. We have ideas of numbers, not because it's innate, but because every culture makes a number or discovers them. And so his claim is, is that we can explain this universal agreement by not by being built in everybody, but by everyone has similar experiences. So we don't need any ideas. Now what he's using here is what's called an inference to the best explanation. And that is, when you're trying to explain something in science or metaphysics or epistemology, whatever can explain it at the least cost is better. So it's a lot like buying a phone or a car. You want to get the most phone or the most car for the least money. Likewise, whatever explains a phenomena with the least like weirdness or cost, the better. So give an example of like the sun. It's, it's kind of a dumb example, but we'll use that one. You could say, well, people have the idea of the sun built in, plus they also see the sun. Or you could just say, well, they get the idea of the sun because everyone sees the sun. And that's a cheaper idea, because you don't need any ideas. You just need the sun, and we already got the sun. So he says, you don't need those weird eight ideas to explain this, so you don't accept them. Just say, as Nancy Reagan used to say, just say no. Secondly, he says, if they were innate, you'd expect to find them everywhere. If they're all built into us. And to use an analogy, if you have chocolate chip cookies, what do you expect to find in every cookie? Chocolate chips. Otherwise, by definition, it is not a chocolate chip cookie. So if everyone, if anyone ever says to you, here's some chocolate chip cookies, and there's no chocolate chips in them, they're lying. They're filthy animals. <laughs> lying about it. It's been done. It turns out they're raisins sometimes. That is the worst. Raisins are the devil's blueberries. That's all I'm going to say about that. I have a real hate, hate relationship with blueberries. I'm going to raisins. Love the raisins. So the idea is that if we all had them, we would all have them. So you could go anywhere and, and find these ideas. But as Locke points out, if you go to people like different cultures, if you go to very young children, etc., you don't find all these supposedly innate ideas. Now, proponents of any ideas could counter this by saying, well, maybe, because you know, they didn't, this is obvious, people have all the same ideas. But people like Leibniz and others said, well, they're in there, but you have to kind of work to get them. So people in other cultures may not just have you know, gut those, but if you really worked at it, you could, you could find them. But Locke says, no, if, you, if they're in there, everyone should be aware of them, and whatever culture you go to, everyone should have those same innate ideas. And Locke says, you don't see that, so they're not, they're not a thing. It'd be kind of like if, you look, if someone claimed there were chocolate chips in the cookies, and you look at every cookie and they're not chocolate chips, you would say, no, there are no the chocolate chips on Lastly, moral principles. Some thinkers claim that we have moral knowledge built into us. So we know the knowledge of good and evil baked right in there. Now, Monk denies that. And the way he argues for this is similar to what he argues against universal knowledge. If you travel around the world in the seven seas, does everyone have the same moral principles? Yeah. No, even you don't have to travel that far. You just like ask, just go on Facebook and start and fire it up. <laughs> You'll see people with very different opinions. And so his reasoning is if they were innate, everyone would have the same, same morality. But this is not the case, so they're not innate. Now this could be covered. You could say everyone does know the difference between good and bad. Some people are just bad and they're lying about, about it. Or, like I've been said, we have the ideas, but they're hard to really kind of like sort out and, and figure out how they and people get confused about, they think good is what they want, as opposed to what is good. Now, Locke doesn't reject objective morality. So he said to Locke, before he died, is morality, moral ideas innate? He'd say, no. Are they objective? He would say, yeah. Because to be objective, they don't have to be, be innate. That's not a rather part. So he says, innate ideas, done. There are no innate ideas. Before moving on, anything about that? Poor reasons. <laughs> we need some more stuff. Truly terrible. 
So if he rejects any ideas, what's he got going on? Well, here's theory of knowledge is very Newtonian. I don't like the cookies, the big cookies. They're kind of weird cookies. Get delicious. So here's his view. So if nothing is, if nothing is in here at the start, then how do we get stuff in there? Well, here's how the chemistry works. Our good dead friend um, Sir Isaac Newton, who yeah, the Apple story probably not true. His view was, was this, that so this is space, that we draw. Now, as Newton saw it, space is like a box that holds our stuff, and there are particles of matter in there. And kind of the Newtonian model is you get space, absolute space, and then in it are these particles that combine together to make up larger stuff. Like you and me and TV and backpacks and squirrels and uh, kiwis with the fruit in and the bird. And so the idea is that the complex things are made up of simple things and everything is in space. It's really, really big. Now Newton had this view and Locke essentially copies it. He says that the mind is kind of initially like empty space. So nothing in there. Then what happens according to him is that through our senses we interact with the stuff that's out there. So we see the kiwi, the fruit, or the bird. It's happy because it's got a kiwi fruit in it for lunch. And so we'd see it, and then we'd get ideas. Now, the first type of ideas are what he calls simple ideas. And these are, well, simple because they're not complicated. They're, they're just little bits. And the, the first type would be ideas of sensation. Now, one sort of metaphorical way to present it is this. You could kind of think of it like, um, have you ever used a, a paint program like paint or um, use like a more expensive one like Photoshop, what you can do is when you get an image in there, you can zoom, keep zooming and zooming until you get down to the pixels. You know? And so you'll see that any image that's a, um, a bitmap, called a bitmap image as opposed to a vector, is made up of pixels of color. And all those pixels together make up the picture. And whatever picture you got, no matter if you can zoom that far enough, you'll see pixels. So one way to think of a simple idea of sensation visually would be like those pixels. So when you look at the kiwi, the fruit of the bird, if you were to like metaphorically zoom in, you would have a whole bunch of pixels in there. And each little pixel would be like a simple idea. It'd be like the smallest bit of color in our visual field, just like in a a program like Photoshop, it'd be like maximum zoom, and that'd be as zoomed as you could zoom, <laughs> the zoomiest, I guess, I suppose. And you would be as far as zoomed as you could be. It'd be the smallest, smallest bit. Now, of course, we could also, in the metaphor breaks down, when you talk about like sounds, it'd be like the tiniest bit of sound or the tiniest bit of flavor. And so you'd have all these little tiny bits in there. So simple ideas would be all those tiny bits. And you get them through the, the senses. The second type of simple idea would be ideas of reflection. Now even though Locke didn't believe in innate ideas, he believed the brain or mind had, you know, it could do stuff. So to use an analogy, it's like if you took your computer and just like erased your hard drive, you're, you could still start putting stuff in because your processor could still process. So you can think of, by analogy, the mind would be like a CPU with memory and a hard drive, but it'd be like you take it out of the box and there's nothing in the hard drive, you know, put all the stuff in there. 
And so you have all this, once you get all this stuff in there, then your mind can start doing stuff with it. It can start reflecting on it. So we have these ideas of reflection, which are about the operations of our mind. So we have little bits, to use the painting metaphor. Then we have our reflection of what our mind is doing. We're aware of, we have ideas of our mind doing stuff. So those would be the little, to use the metaphor, the little bits of ideas that we get in there. So through our senses, we get stuff in there, then our mind starts doing stuff with it, and we get ideas about the bits and what our mind's doing with the, with the bits. Anything, before we go on to the next slide, anything about the bits or kiwis? Kiwis are a good source of nutrition. The, fruit. the birds are dangerous. They might be delicious though. But they're also cute. They're too, you know, so. And they're kind of the national bird in the so. Now, so what then are our complex ideas? Well, complex ideas are made by combining, shockingly enough, simple ideas. So the way we get those is by taking the simple ideas and combining them. Now, Monk essentially says, here's how we get these complex ideas. And there's a couple ways to do it. One of these by compounding. And compounding is what? Yeah, putting stuff together. So we could we could combine like our simple bits of ideas to combine them to create an existing thing, kiwi. Just like to use a metaphor, if you've got like your color palette in Photoshop, you could you know, draw a kiwi. And we could do the same thing in our mind. Or you could take uh, like ideas like of kiwis and start you know copy pasting them and create a whole bunch of, of kiwis. And so a lot of things we can we can take our ideas and combine them together. And just like you know Descartes noted in his painter analogy, we can take things and put together you know fictional things. You can take like the uh, roughly speaking the idea of like the top part of the human, bottom part of the horse, get a center. So once we've got ideas in there, we can start you know doing stuff with them. Now one thing a lot of believed in that uh, really bless you, Thank you. really super annoyed uh, a later British empiricist named um, Barclay, who um, Bishop Barclay, he's the uh, tree falls in the forest guy, and he really hated these abstract ideas. But here's the idea: abstract ideas go back to way back to our good dead friend. Requirements. And here's kind of the problem. It also goes, the need for them kind of goes back to Plato, because if you don't want to wait, if you don't want to be like Plato, you might need to use like these abstract ideas. But here's the idea. So one problem in philosophy is called the problem of universals, which we saw with Plato, which is if you get like cats. Yeah, the question is what, in virtue of what are multiple cats, cats. Now Plato would say, of course, there'd be the form of cat, and that links up all the cats. Or in Spanish, gato. Now Locke didn't seem to believe in Platonic forms, and neither did Tommy, Tommy Aquinas. So the question then is, how do you like have all cats be cats, and how do we like recognize cats as cats without bringing in weird metaphysical well, Thomas Aquinas hit on this idea, and then Locke you know, stole it, of doing abstraction. And the idea is basically this. You would abstract out from all your cat ideas, not like the Platonic form of cats, because you know, it doesn't believe in that, but you'd end up with the abstract cat, which sounds like a good name for an indie man, abstract cat. 
many philosophical terms than in the stuff. Now, this cat would have nothing that's particular to any cat, but it would have the features that are common to all cats, some of them. So you have somehow this notion of cat that's not a platonic form, and is not any particular cat, but abstracts out catness, how would that work? Now, Barclay, as we'll see in the future, he said, that's crazy, because what would it be if you took away, like, all the particulars of a cat and were just left with all the things that all cats have? It would be, like, nothing. That was his claim. But the Locke thinks, and Tommy Aquinas believed, that somehow you could, you could extract out from the cat all your individual cat experiences this abstract cat. And that would be the, the template that you use to recognize all cats, however that would work. Now this also became a practical problem, uh, which Google has been working on as well, is how do we recognize like images? You know, if you're gonna sort out images. So it used to be if you did a search on an image like cat, it wouldn't search the images, it'd look for text with image beside it. So if you just search by cat, you end up with like just all kinds of weird right. stuff because it looks for a word in your, in your cat. So if it's someone talking about their cats, and a picture of them, that's the picture you, you get. And so what you need is something that can go through all the pictures of cats and, and sort out what that is. And today we, we talk about there being like a, an algorithm or a cat algorithm that allows you to sort it out. So as you would that we're able to somehow abstract from all of our particular experiences this abstract idea that somehow stands for all cats. And similarly for all, it stands for all desks and humans and laptops. That way if you look at like different laptops, they're all they're different colors and sizes, we recognize them all as laptops. Similarly like if you look at different desks, we recognize them all as desks, dogs, we recognize them all as dogs. So somehow we have that, we can do it, the question is how. And he says abstract ideas. And then Barclay says, that's crazy, and it leads to atheism. So stop. Stop doing that. Before moving away from abstract ideas, which are super problematic, anything about them or, or cats <laughs> needs more stuff. Now we saw back in the earlier days the notions of primary and secondary qualities. And as we recall, primary qualities are supposed to be where? Where do they need? Oh. Primary that'd be color? yeah, secondary. Oh, would be okay. the, yeah, the colors and way the way things you know feel okay, and so It's supposed to be the stuff that's really out there for, for real, like shape, volume, density, mass. Okay. And the secondary qualities of those you mentioned, you know, the color, the um, you know, texture, warmth, coolness, etc. So Locke believed that out there, there would be stuff. And it would have, you know, the qualities, you know, those primary qualities, mass, density, volume, etc. And then when we interact with it, we would get the secondary qualities. So, like an like, example of like cereal. You know, cereal is a certain molecular you know, composition and it triggers a taste. And that would be a secondary quality. Or when you're looking at, when you see like the colors, the colors aren't out there, near and all are not. And similarly, warmth and your temperature's out there, but warmth and coolness is, is not. That's how we, we feel about stuff. And Locke accepts that that standard division. There's the qualities that are out there for real, and then there are secondary qualities, which are our experiences caused by them. Now he does, he does kind of bring in a third quality called powers, which are the qualities that bring about changes in, in bodies. But he, he kind of lets that go, like in, in different editions of the work, he has it and then doesn't have it. And so, not clear how committed he is to that. Probably not very. And the primary qualities probably get the, get the job done. Because it's, it's kind of redundant to say you get primary qualities, 
and the equalities that do things to other primary equalities. And most thinkers just shove them in. But he does make the note, he does sort of seem to sort of like toy with or consider you know, a third set of qualities, but that seems to be like needlessly excessive. So probably not. So how does he reason about the distinction? Well, Locke does the, the usual arguments. So for example, um, you know, many of the philosophers at this time use the three bowl of water argument. You've got a bowl of ice water, a bowl of hot water, a bowl of warm water. And so you stick your hand in the cold, then in the middle it feels warm. You stick your hand in the warm, stick in the middle it feels cold, cool. And so the idea is that we get these different you know, experiences that are clearly not out there in the world, just how we feel about and then there are the usual general arguments about you know, color, you know, how colors vary with our perceptions, etc. And so his primary secondary quality you know, thing, pretty much standard, nothing, nothing un, really unusual there. So primary qualities, qualities that are really out there, mass, density, volume, etc. Secondary qualities, the qualities we experience, and the advances of the usual arguments that there are qualities out there, that are objective, but then using things like the bowls of water, the color, etc., we see that they're bowls of not, not the same stuff. And this also drives Barclay nuts. So he, he gets rid of all of these and says there's just there's just qualities. we saw back in the ancient days and before time, epistemologists tend to fall into you know, these general categories. We saw there's naive or direct realism, which very few people accept once they get corrupted by science and philosophy. And that is, again, go back to metaphor, what you see is what you get. That, to use the material metaphor, it's like you are riding around in your head, literally just looking at it, stuff. Again, the metaphor blows up because then there's a person then there's representational realism, which is there's objects out there, and you have an idea of the object, and somehow it represents what is real, hence representative realism. Now, Locke notes one implication of this is, and similar to what, what Descartes argued about the lives, interestingly enough, is that we what we see is the result of judgment. That there is the idea that sort of like appears, you know, sensory data that appears in our mind, but then there's another step that happens so quickly we don't realize we're doing it, but we have a step of judgment. And he gives the following example. If we look at, um, well, if we had like a globe, I guess I can use the uh, mouse is not a great example. I'll use the mouse. Like with mouse, we see you know it's got like a, seeming like a shape to it. But you could also look at the mouse as like a, if somebody had like confined skill in drawing, you could be holding a piece of paper cleverly shaded so it looks like it's <coughs> really shaped that way. And so what we end up doing is we don't see the depth or see the third dimension we we judge on. And here's a good illustration of this. Uh, years ago when I was in grad school, I was up for a run in Ohio, and then um, a hailstorm came up. Not just like a little hailstorm, but one with like golf ball that was like getting whacked in the head with golf balls, which kind of stings. And I decided I had, I had a lot more beating. And so I was running um, by the stadium there, and I could see alcoves. And I thought, okay, I get it, I can get in that out. Because of course, all the doors are locked and sealed because I don't want anybody defiling the stadium by, by running, running mm -hmm. there. It's only for football. And so I you know, run to the alcove, and, and I realize as soon as I get there, I'm like, oh, son of a weasel. They're painted. There's no, it's, but it was well painted. I was like, that's really well done. I couldn't realize until I got close, really close to it that it was totally fake. I'm like, no, cushy. <laughs> and so I, I didn't see the depth because there was no depth. I judged there was depth. My mind was interpreting. It's how we, uh, 
like when you play you know, computer games or, or actually just you, or use, um, another example, if you go to the movie theaters and you put on the 3D glasses, it's really not three dimensional, but your brain is being kind of tricked into judging it to be three dimensional. And that's in a way how um, all art works. You know, when you, when you have the shading and so forth, it's all flat, but it creates the, the better the person is, the greater the illusion of, of depth. And so P. Seems right. We see not a alcove, we see colors, and we judge it to be, to have depth. We see you know, a circle of different shades, and we judge it to be a globe. So, currently, as far as I know. Now, he also brought up a problem that, interestingly, has actually been, been solved, which is this. Long, there's a question raised by this fellow, um, Bono, I think I'm pronouncing that totally wrong. Well. Should be able to pronounce it better. It sounds, it sounds French. I should have, I should have like built in the whole French, French capacity. I totally did not though. Because never learned. Well, two years in high school, that totally doesn't count. And apparently the genes are the genes aren't enough. It's not the language is not wired to the genes. So the Bono problem, or Bono, or something. The problem is this. Imagine someone who is born blind and they never saw. But if you gave them shapes, they could separate, you know, squares and spheres and so forth. And they could get, you know, as, as people who are blind from birth do, they can get around the world and they can recognize stuff. Now imagine if they regained their sight, and the instant they regained their, their sight, you had objects on the table in front of them. And they had to judge which one determined which one corresponded to the shapes they knew. So they, they do know by touch, you know, sphere, triangle, um, you know, square, etc. Would they be able to tell which was which just by looking at it? And Locke says no, because his theory of ideas is there's nothing in your in here that you didn't get from the senses. And so even though you've touched those objects, you've never seen them. So you'd have no ideas, you'd have no visual ideas of shapes. Now Locke said he believed that the person, given his theory, would not be able to tell. Now, questions? Now they weren't able to test it, because I mean, you, you had to like get someone and then give them sight and then immediately have them, you know, go and figure, try to figure out. As one of my professors said, you know, someone gets their sight and suddenly, suddenly they get sight. The last thing I want to do is like sort out between the cubes and stuff. But they were able to actually conduct this experiment because there is um, there are obviously conditions that are um, fixable where someone is they never see, but they can fix you know just some you know do like a surgery and they can see. And there is um, actually a fairly large scale project where, uh, in a way, you can see it as kind of like good but maybe kind of evil science, where they would do the surgery on people, but kind of like part of the, the process was they would agree to participate in these like experiments to, to see how like, you know, sites work. And they found that Locke was right. If you have someone who can't tell stuff apart, they get the operation to get their site, maybe they can't even touch either site restore or, or site, they get the site. And then the, then the first thing they do is like test see if they can tell by sight the objects, they, they can't. It's actually fairly interesting, super interesting to see <coughs> how perception <coughs> works based on people who are adults, but didn't have sight until they were adults. So we normally think of, for example, well, think of like a cow. We divide a cow up as like a cow. You know, so if you, if you had a picture of a cow, and you were asked to like, you know, determine how many objects were there, you would draw like a round cow, you would see the cow. But they found that, like they had a cow that had like color patterns, they don't, you know, they know what a cow is, but they never seen the cow. Right. So they're asked to draw it, they would draw, the cow would be multiple objects, because it would be like this color, that color, because you have to learn that the whole thing is cow. And it's something we learn, we don't see. So interestingly, those experiments all basically supported Locke, that we judge, and we, we don't think we do because when we're young, 
we're just picking up all the stuff without really reflecting on it, and then we do it automatically. But when you have someone who's an adult who's never seen before or suddenly sees, they've got to do all that stuff, and they're they're you know adults and they know things, so they can say they can clearly say things like, "Well, this seems to be like multiple objects." So Locke turned out to be right about a lot of a lot of stuff, and a lot of people got their sight. So that was, I guess, it's when. So, problem solved. <laughs> now, Locke thinks that we have varying degrees of knowledge and types of knowledge. Now, he doesn't think that knowledge is subjective. So he doesn't think there'd be like, you could know this, and then you could know like, it's denial. I mean, there are views like that, where you could, like, you could have like a divided reality, where you could know like one thing and also know its opposite. Locke think, thinks like, if something's true, it's true, it's not subjective. But he thinks there's different ways of, or different categories of knowledge. To use a metaphor, like knowledge of chemistry is knowledge, but it's not knowledge of biology. I mean, it's all knowledge, but it's separate stuff. So what are his categories? Well, first is what he calls intuitive knowledge. This is stuff that you know as soon as you understand it. Now, you might think, well, wouldn't that be like a priori knowledge? Well, some critics, of course, would say, yeah, because you it's self-evident. But Locke notes that you don't have it built in. So it's not that you know it already, and you just gotta poke around the mental attic, you know, take it out and say, oh, that's, there it is, this stuff. He thinks that what you have to do is understand it first, then you see it's true. And so this would be Mathematics. Uh, also, he thinks you have, you have intuitive knowledge, like Descartes believed, of your own existence. That you, once you're aware of yourself, you know you exist. But it's not, he doesn't think it's a name. Similarly, like mathematics and geometry and so forth, um, a lot of that stuff would be intuitive. But again, you know it as soon as you understand it, but it's not built in, which is a minor distinction. Seemingly, but a, but a critical one. Namely, if, you, if it was never brought up to you, you would never know. You have to understand it first, then you get it or you have. Second is what he calls demonstrative knowledge. And this is knowledge you get by doing proofs. Now, someone like you know, Descartes and, and Plato would think you could prove the existence of stuff this way. Because one of the big debates is, could you like sit there doing some logic -y stuff and prove stuff? You prove things exist. And Descartes said, yeah. Now interestingly enough, for the most part, Locke thinks that the demonstrative knowledge is not about the world. So you can prove that two plus two is four. You can prove that triangles have three sides. But you can't prove that, or you can prove like a billion is a billion sides. But you couldn't prove one exists. But Locke allows one exception. And that exception is? Well, who's always the exception for philosophers? Oh. Yeah, God. <laughs> always the exception. <laughs> yeah, so he thinks that we can do, we can prove God demonstrably. And that's the only, only case. Everything else, no. So in a way, he, he gets a little bit of, maybe a little bit of rationalism on his shoes because <laughs> of this, this part. But it's God, so he's, you know, people really aren't going to call a lot of that it's God's. Is the exception. All of the rest of the knowledge is what he calls sensitive knowledge. Now, kind of a weird, weird thing, because you normally think of like sensitive knowledge as what? Like sensitive information. Yeah, like, is it like the stuff you gain from your senses? Is that what I mean? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, because, you know, normally think of sensitive information as things like we don't want out there. Right. <laughs> you know, like our, you know, Social security number or passwords. But here, exactly right. It's the, it's the stuff that comes from the senses. So this is everything else. So intuitive knowledge is stuff you just know once you understand it, uh, and you know your own existence this way. Demonstrative knowledge is through you know, proofs, and the only thing you know exists this way according to Locke is God. And then sensitive knowledge is everything else, everything you get through the senses. 
So, except for yourself and God, everything else that you know exists, you know that it exists through your senses. So, he agrees with Descartes. You know who you are. You can know that God is. And everything else comes from the senses. So what about his view of certainty? Because Descartes, as we saw, wanted this absolute certainty. Now Locke says, we want that, but we're not going to get it. So it's kind of like a Tesla. You may want one, <laughs> but maybe you'll get one, but probably not today. Maybe you won't. They're so expensive. They're so cool. It's so expensive. I always worry it's like, get an accident. There's $100,000 <laughs> down the toilet. So he says we want it, we're not going to do it. <laughs> so we're talking about this use of sort of metaphor, namely that we want the light of the sun to illuminate everything. We want absolute certainty. But all we have is a little candle to light, to light our way. And so he thinks that we're not going to get that. I mean, yeah, in the case of you can be sure you exist. And you can be sure about God, but everything else, that's not going to be absolutely certain. So he's willing to have a much lower, weaker standard than, than Descartes. Now, one thing that you could say that's better, because if the, if you sort of admit, okay, we're not going to have certainty, then you can say what kind of things do we are probably true. But also, on the downside, does open the door for the skeptic, because the skeptic will say, well, if you have a good certainty, then, then I win, because everything is uncertain except your existence in God at best. Everything else is up for grabs. <coughs> so what does Locke say to the skeptic? Well, he says, not so fast, skeptic. Now, the skeptic, of course, doubts the stuff. And he's thinking of um, our good dead friend Descartes. Because Locke, uh, although De Descartes wasn't on the curriculum when Locke was in college, he had like an illicit copy that he kept under his pillow, I suppose, and, and read when he wasn't supposed to. And it had an influence on him. And so the skeptic is, he's kind of thinking of Descartes here. Although, of course, Descartes, his whole point is to try to beat the skeptic and end up in certainty. So the skeptic, the true skeptic, says, you don't know stuff. Now, Locke first gives kind of a joking reply. He says, well, the skeptic really can have no quarrel with me because the skeptic doesn't even know if I exist to have a quarrel with, which is kind of a you know, smart, smart reply. And you kind of like uh, today, if someone was having a skeptical battle on Twitter, and someone said, you know, you can't know anything, the person replies back, well, you can't know that, that I exist, they disagree with you, so don't be mad. Now, of course, the humorous reply doesn't prove anything, just kind of humorous. So Locke advances four, actually five, because he kind of smushes a couple together, uh, arguments as to why the skeptic um, shouldn't be accepted. Now, his reply is not, I know this with certainty, so take that, skeptic. His reply is going to be, in a way, a very practical one. Namely, here are four reasons to think that we are probably right. And this is good enough. So the skeptic, one, in a way, wants to say, certainty or you don't know anything. And Locke says, well, no. We just need, that's setting it to, that's setting the goals too high. We just need to have an adequate amount of you know, understanding. And that is good enough. So if the skeptic said, but you don't have certainty, Locke would say, yeah, I don't have certainty. But I, what I got is you know, pragmatically good enough. So what are his arguments? <coughs> Well, we go like this. First confirmation is the production of ideas, namely this. Um, and it also kind of ties into the second part that these things are unavoidable. But in terms of the ideas, what he claims is this. If our ideas were just in our mind and not from outside, and he's going after kind of that you know, Cartesian super skepticism, it's just you and nothing else out there. He raises the point that, well then, if these things didn't come into the senses, then you could smell roses in winter. And he doesn't mean like, you know, 
you know, with a greenhouse. You could see colors in the dark, and you can know the taste of pineapple before you taste it. And so his claim is, is that we have to get the ideas through the senses. Otherwise, if we could just pop them into our heads, we just have all these ideas that are anything possible. So what is he right about that? I think so. Yeah, the way it's appealing. Yeah, because you know, no matter how long you sat there thinking, you wouldn't know what pineapple tasted like until you taste the pineapple. Mm -hmm. But Descartes or someone the skeptic could argue back, well, you know, in dreams, you're getting ideas that are not coming through your, your senses. And then, of course, Locke could probably argue, well, in a way like did, Descartes did, and his painter objection, well, you couldn't have those ideas without something causing them. And again, Locke is kind of practical. It's like, well, <laughs> you're not going to get these ideas unless there's something causing them. Second is unavoidable. Namely, that the idea, and Descartes also considered this, if the, uh, if the ideas we had were just creating our mind, roughly put, we should have more control over things. But you know, if you use an analogy, it'd be like, you know, if your mind was like Photoshop, you're just making this stuff up, you should be able to like Photoshop stuff. Like, I don't want that, I want this, etc. But how much control do we have over what seems to be reality? Yeah, not much. <laughs> you know, terrifyingly little. So yeah, like if you know you're driving along and a car comes in your lane, you can't like whoop, edit that car out. You know, it just it literally is unavoidable in that scenario. Yeah, and Descartes also considered this. That we, the ideas just kind of you know impinge upon us, and we don't seem to have have control of them. So that would seem to suggest they're not coming from us. And again, a skeptic would say, well, maybe you are just making all this stuff up. And they, of course, are pointing to dreams. Yeah, where things can happen in your dreams they would not want to, to happen. Like, last night I had a dream that my arm was broken, like my bone was sticking out. I did not want that. That woke me up. I was like, Phew. <laughs> You probably have those dreams where like, something horrible happens, you wake up and you're like, oh good, I still, right. have, I still have my arm. <laughs> that, that was good. <laughs> yeah, so, maybe. Third confirmation, you kind of smush the two together, pain and measurement. Now, he does know the following. Think of like, um, oh, like if you ever burned your hand or had an injury or something. If you think of that, does it, hurt? I mean, it may cause like emotional distress, think of like past injuries, but does it hurt to think of like the time you burned your hand? No, no. So you can bring up these ideas of injuries and so forth, and they don't cause you cause you pain. And also, like you, if you think of like the idea of like the fi a fire, it can't warm you in winter, and the idea of food can't like nourish you when there's no no food. That'd be crazy. It would be crazy. Like, think of all the money you'd save on groceries. Right. But you have to be really careful what you thought about because you may like be setting yourself on fire and, and stuff. <laughs> Well, I think it's a, yeah, there's like a sci-fi thing. Wherever, wherever you think, oh, the um, yeah, the uh, Ghostbusters. You know, they, like when Gozer, the destructor, you know, says choose the form of your destroyer, and whatever you think of is what's going to destroy them. And that's why it's the big. If you ever wonder like why is it the big Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, it's because um, um, one of the one of the characters thought of that. After the thing. That is why it's a giant marshmallow man. Fun facts about. It. The original was really good, really good movie. The remake, they just, not because it was, they had women in the lead, that was not, the issue was just, it was just a bad, a bad movie. I really tried to like it, because I really liked the original. Sad. But anyways, <laughs> so like pain, you can, you can think of pain, and it's not going to cause the same, same pain. So Locke's view is kind of an interesting one, because if it's all just in your mind, you should be able to weirdly hurt yourself with your own ideas. I don't mean like cause like emo you know, like emotional distress, but you should be able to like cause pain. But fortunately, you can't do that. So, no matter how much you think of like you know your arm 
even in dreams, you know, the pain is not as, as intense. You, you feel kind of like memory of pain. And Locke seems to be right. Reality hurts a whole bunch. And that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good guy. You know, stuff, reality, a big distinction is you're thinking of like a cut or a burn doesn't hurt like the real thing. That seems to be a pretty important distinction. The measurement thing, he, um, nothing to do with pain, but he says, not a great art, but he says, if you, he notes that when people do proofs, like geometric proofs or mathematical proofs or logical proofs, they use like symbols. You, know, you write out you know, numbers or put in like a triangle or something. And he says it'd be weird to be totally confident of the results, but doubt those that the symbols and stuff exist. Now, of course, the reply that a skeptic would make would be, well, one could be they doubt everything. So yeah, they, they do doubt all that stuff. The other would be as well, like Descartes said, you can still do math in a dream. So if you're dreaming of doing math, or rather a nightmare, there's really not a board there you're doing math on, but your calculations could be accurate. And people have, you know, people have said like they're taking tests or working on problems, they do solve them sometimes in their, their sleep. And they're obviously not really working on the board. Now again, Locke doesn't claim these are like death blows to skepticism. He's basically saying these are reasons we have to think we're probably not. You know, this is probably real. And the fourth one, he says, the senses all sort of support each other. They would seem to, you know, be consistently together. <coughs> And he gives like the example of, um, well, if you write something down on, this may seem like a sixth reason. He says if you write stuff, that it stays permanent. That you can go and check it in later, or you can give it to someone else to, to read. Now, that is a certain appeal, but the only way you know that something you've written has said the same thing, is saying the same thing now as then is what do you want? Yeah, your memory, which could be totally off. Maybe it's totally, maybe it's, you know, so if your memory has changed and the text has changed, it could be a totally different text because your memory is just being, being messed with. Like, yep, that's exactly what I wrote. And yeah, so the only way you can, you can confirm the text is the same is your memory being the same. If you give it to someone else and they read it, well, you're assuming there is someone else and you're relying it on your, your memory. So, again, doesn't give you certainty. Now, again, yeah, Locke doesn't say that this gives him absolute certainty. So what he concludes is that this is adequate, <laughs> which is probably not the best, the best compliment to say, like job review, adequate. <laughs> but he thinks his approach is, again, he says, although we want the light of the sun, all we've got is a little candle to light our way. And he's taking a very practical approach. He would want to have certainty, but he thinks we're not going to do that. So he says, what we, can, what we go by is not certainty, but what works. And the gist of it basically is this. He says, kind of, again, kind of jokingly the skeptic, if someone's skeptical about a fire, they can test it out by sticking their head in there and seeing how that, that goes. Now, the furnace may not be real, but no one's going no to do that. Right. Because deep down, we don't doubt that the furnace is real, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt a bunch. And so, Locke does make a good approach. I mean, it doesn't, it's not conclusive. The fact that no skeptic is gonna stick their head in the furnace doesn't prove the furnace exists, <laughs> but it is an interesting point. Shouldn't you say then he's accepting like realist theories and stuff like that? Yeah, he's being very, you know, pragmatic about it. You know, like realistic, like, yeah, you can't know for sure if the fire is real, but I'm not gonna stick my head in there. And he says, in a way, the analogy I always use to Locke is, it's kind of like the video game approach. When you're playing a video game, you actually know it's not, it's not real. It's just, just a game. You're, you're there with your controller, moving your character around. But when you're playing the game to enjoy it, you don't stand your character in like fire, unless you just enjoy dying. Uh, you, know, you, you stay out of the fire. You, I mean, nothing there is really going to hurt you. But you play it like it does, like you avoid, you know, 
getting killed by monsters just because it's annoying. And Locke, in a way, takes, you didn't know about video games, but a similar approach to what? Is the fire real? I don't know. But if you step in it, you know, it seems to hurt a whole bunch. Um, is your lunch real? I don't know, but it's like in a you know video game. If you're playing you know Zelda Breath of the Wild and you're not eating your your, your food properly, you, know, you, you fail, you die. Um, in life, you don't eat your food, you you die. So maybe this is just fake. It's just a game. But you know, if if you don't play by the, the rules, then it just kind of sucks. You know, it hurts, etc. So again, Locke is very practical. We don't have certainty, but what matters is not do we know absolutely certainly that fire is real that lunch is real, that uh, lionfish, which are really poisonous, are real. It, no, we don't know that. But we, we have the information we need. Namely, you don't grab a hold of a lionfish, because mm -hmm. it's all poisonous and stuff. You eat, you eat meals, because you don't you know, get a feeling of starvation. So it takes a very practical approach to it. Now, if you're looking for a paper topic, um, one this is a pretty good, pretty good subject. Namely, uh, is taking the practical approach the most sensible approach to skepticism? Where you, where you just say, well, yeah, I don't know absolutely for sure if fire is real, or buses are real, or lion fish are real, uh, or that my landlord wanted my money is real. But you could argue, like with a video game analogy, from a practical standpoint, it doesn't, doesn't matter because when you're playing a game, we know the fire is fake, but if you want to enjoy the game, you don't just keep walking your character in the fire until you run out of life, or until everyone else you know, rage quits. Do you cost them in the Okay, before pressing on to our next exciting slide, anything about this one? Or not dying in fire? I need more stuff. <laughs> So Locke ends up basically with a practical view, which is to be summed up of don't stand in the fire. You don't know if it's real, but don't stand in That's right, Dave. Don't stand in the fire. Or play hunters. Anyways, long story. Um, we now turn to our good dead friend, David Hume. Sharp dresser. Cool wings. And also a British empiricist, who is super dead. Uh, he died, he was born, and then he died in 1776, probably of ulcerative colitis or something else. Um, and of course, he's still dead today. In his own time, he got into a fair amount of trouble because of his skeptical views of religion. Um, but also, he wanted to be super famous, and eventually did get famous. He was best known in his own time for writing the history of England, and he wrote a big book that was a total, total flop initially. But he followed a practice, which is a very good one if you are a writer. If you write a lot of stuff and it flops, don't just throw away the, the book. What you can do is just keep, one option is you keep <laughs> trying to get someone to publish it until you run out of publishers, which is an option you know, today. Um, and of course, today you have an option of going just self-publishing. You know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Apple, if they, you don't pay them, they pay you if you sell them. So the other thing is if you have a book and it's like kind of a mess, you can redo it and then repackage parts of it and sell those, which is what he did. He took uh, his first book, just basically landed with a disappointing thud, and he was very sad, but he didn't give up. He took that book and chopped it up into chunks, rewrote it, repackaged it, and they were successful. And now his original crappy first book is still successful because they still make people in philosophy read that. It's still for sale centuries later. So even his crappy book has been a great success. So Hume's a good lesson that if you do something crappy, just keep hanging in there and someday you'll be dead. I'm sorry, then you'll be a success. <laughs> yeah, the dead part, that's, that's also true. So ended up being pretty successful. So what was his goals and motivations? Well, he starts off similar to the other dead guys we're looking at, namely this. He looks around at philosophy and science and says, wow, this is like all kinds of stuff, but it's a, it's a mess. You know, there's, there's no certainty, it's all messy, etc." And at first he seems like he's gonna be 
like the other dead guys, well, for their death. <coughs> like he's got to go, okay, we got to get like this, you know, solve these problems, get to the certainty. But he ends up doing something different. What is this? Descartes and Locke and the others we looked at, they're always trying to answer like philosophical questions, like how do you know? And or the metaphysical questions like what is there? And epistemic questions like what do you know? How do you know? Hume, his approach is he thinks if you figure out humans, because he saw us as sort of like the measure of all things, that would enable you to solve all the other problems. He thinks the mistake people were making was they were looking at like epistemology or metaphysics, but not looking at people. You need to look at people, solve the problems. So one effect this has is he ends up in a way doing more psychology than philosophy. For example, when you look at his bit about um, skepticism regarding the senses, or also like the notions of causation. He, I'll use the example of causation. Hume doesn't say, what is causation? Which would be a metaphysical question. His question is, why do we believe in causation? To use an analogy. If there's a kid who believes there's a monster in your closet, when the parents go to a psychologist, the psychologist doesn't say, describe for me this monster, so we, we, we may know which weapon to use to slay this beast. Is it vulnerable to silver or wood or magic? No, the psychologist doesn't say what is the monster, because the assumption is there is no monster. The question is, why does little Billy or Sally think there's a monster? So for law, I mean for Hume, the question of you know causation is not what is causation, because he thinks we can know that. The question is, why do we believe it? Why do we think there's a monster in the closet? Which is an interesting approach on one hand. The other hand, though, in a way, it doesn't really solve a philosophical problem. Now, like um, Locke and Descartes, he also does this thing where he you know, divides stuff up in terms of the ideas. So there are perceptions, and perceptions are pretty much what they some, namely getting to the bad drawings. So we have the perception, which is sort of like when you are, roughly put, when you are experiencing it at that moment. So live stream, I guess would be the, the analogy. There are also impressions, which would be well, essentially like our, our memories. You can think of them as metaphorically like in impressions. Like, um, you think of it as, well, like footprints in mud. Or like a stamp, you know, with ink, putting it on a paper. And he sees these as, he describes them as less lively ideas. So the perceptions would have, you know, like you're looking in the room now, would, would have this like intensity to it. And then if you close your eyes and try to remember it, it's kind of like less, you know, less body. Similar things, I mean, kind of like going back to Locke's point. Our memories of things are kind of like faded, weaker versions of the thing itself. And all these for him are these ideas. They're the stuff in the mind. And, of course, he believes question. So the mind has creative power. So you can take, once you get stuff in there, I mean, similar to Locke. He, like Locke, he thinks no innate ideas, so, you know, born, you know, the mind is blank. You get these ideas in them, and then you can start combining them and working them to make up stuff. And he makes up a lot of stuff. Now, like someone like Locke and our good dead friend uh, Newton, he also embraces kind of an atomism of ideas. Now, again, Newton took the view that you get space. Bad drawing. <laughs> uh, <photo -play. laughs> that's, what, that's what space looks like. 
thing in space and you have stuff in space. And the idea is, of course, you're going back to our good dear friend Democritus, it's composed of atoms. You know? And our theory of atoms has been refined ever since. Little bits make up the rest of the stuff. And Hume, like Locke, accepts kind of a similar view. You have these little bits that make up the bigger bits. Now Locke, or rather Hume, sorry, also accepts this association of ideas. That ideas, you know, are well, associated or connected. And of course, one classic saying is we, we associate the smoke with yeah, fire. And so we have ideas that are associated with each. And this is, you know, a form of you know, psychology. He's talking about again how we think about this stuff. Because his sort of his addition was instead of saying, you know, let's talk about you know the stuff, he says, let's start with, with people, figure out like why they think what they do and what's going on there. And his belief was once you figure people out, then you can figure out all the rest of the, the stuff. And so he ends up doing a lot of, a lot of psychology. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about philosophy. You get, uh, and you start, one, you start wondering, is it? Uh, yes, I feel like ignore, add, ignore, add. Is it a real word? <laughs> but all words are made up, ultimately. Now, like our other good dead friends, Hume also divides up how ideas work. Now, kind of the main division we've seen is between things that are a priori that you can know by just pure reason and of course the a posteriori which you know by experience, after experience. Now his division, his terminology uses, is this. He talks about the relations of ideas and for him this would be the a priori stuff. And these would not be talking about the world, they'd be talking about ideas. So to give the usual, usual examples, one example of a relation of ideas would be talking about triangles having three sides. So yeah, you're talking about triangles, but you can talk about them whether they exist or no, you could like you could just agree with them, just you can draw and say they're three-sided figures, and then you say, well, how many angles do they have? The answer is, of course, three. Similarly, uh, like a building, or we can use a better example, the building. You know, how many sides the building have in the building? Is there such a thing? No idea. Or, you know, if someone is a bachelor, we know they're unmarried and male. Is Sam a bachelor? No, no. maybe Sam's a woman. Maybe Sam is a married man. Maybe Sam is a married woman. We don't know. So we know that if Sam is a bachelor, if Sam is a married man, but we don't know the facts about Sam. So those would be relations of ideas. And also like mathematics, logic, etc. So for example, if you have this logic, you know, if if glove, then wub, glove, wub. Perfectly good logic, but we don't obviously well, what, what is he even talking about? <laughs> yeah, but the logic is perfectly Good. It's a valid, it is a valid argument. If one thing well, well, if we're good. <laughs> so those are all relations of ideas. They are in the idea world, but don't connect to the you know, real world, physical world. I mean, to use an analogy, it'd be kind of like, um, this is doesn't, not perfectly good fit, but you can think of it like, um, you know, game rules, or like movie, movie rules. It's like, um, it's how the things relate in that um, game. You know, doesn't have to be a connection to reality, it's just how these things, if they, they are working, they're true, just because of how the tools work. Matters of fact, for him, are about the world. And there would be things like, well, that there are kiwis, fruit, and birds, that um, rabbits have four legs, that cats are mammals, that the Red Sox won the World Series. These would all be facts about the world. Now his view is you can't know those just by thinking about them. You can only figure them out, usually the hard way, 
by experience. So he notes, for example, when the first, when the, you know, the first humans, like Adam and Eve, on the, on that account, when they first saw water, they had no idea that it would drown them. Because you're looking at it, you don't, you don't right. know what it's going to do. You have to learn that the hard way. Yeah, so basically, matter of fact, you know, kind of crude to put, joking put, this is stuff you have to learn the hard way. <laughs> you know, usually with, with awful consequences. <coughs> so Hume thinks that this, we can be certain about this, we can know this by pure reason, but not before experience, because we can't know anything before experience. But it tells us nothing about the world. So, in a way, again, it's kind of like playing a game where everything you do within the game, you're, as long as you're following the rules, you're getting everything right, but it doesn't get outside the, the game. And in this case, the matters of fact are about the world, but you can't just do it, you can't do it by knowing the rules. You've got to get out there and learn what the rules might be the hard way. And spoiler for you, there are really no rules. And you just have, things just happen. And you just kind of hope they keep happening in the same way. Or maybe hope they don't happen the same way. So for him, there's this gap between the two. This can give you certainty, and you can just reason it through. But it tells you nothing about the world. You're like, I know with absolute certainty, billigons have a billion sides. I don't know if there's any billigons. I know with absolute certainty that if Sam is a bachelor, or Sam is unmarried, and man. But do I know if Sam is any of those things for real? I do not know. So the, in the case of matters of fact, no certainty is possible, but it's about the world. Now because of this, um, he will go into Hume's philosophy of religion, but he applies this to religion. He says that this tells us nothing about the world. So Descartes' argument about you know, God is perfect, blah, 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 that's, that isn't right. And with matters of fact, you've got to actually go and find some experience that proves God. And he doesn't say that God definitely doesn't exist. He just says, probably not. We don't have evidence for that. So that's his take on that, that distinction. The reason by itself can be perfectly certain about nothing that is real. Uh, what is existing, you can only know by experience, but you can't be certain about it. So you end up with this, this gap of you can be certain about stuff. I mean, it does matter in a way, but it tells you nothing about the world, and all the stuff that's in the world you can't be certain about. So, pretty bad. Now, the first reading we'll see from Hume is his dreaded skepticism regarding the senses. Now, this is where he brings up the thing I call the monster in the closet thing. Because in the past, the usual question was, do objects exist or not? You know, Descartes' point, is there an external world or not? Hume says, that's the wrong question. The question is not, is there a monster in the closet? The question is, why do we think there's a monster in the closet? So he switches from the question, are there objects out there, to these two questions. And they're both psychological questions. One is, why do we attribute to objects a continued existence? Because I say, why do we think they keep on going even when we're not looking at them? And the second question is, why do we suppose a distinct existence? Namely, that they exist apart from our mind. Now Hume does note that these questions are clearly closely related because if you if you answer why we think they're distinct and don't depend on us, that can give you an answer to why they keep going without us. But again, this is, these are psychological questions. He's not saying how do they exist you know, without us. He's saying why do we, why do we think that? Now, he quickly rejects the senses as answering these questions. So the question is, why do we think, for example, that when we leave our apartment, have a storm, that it's still there? Now, it can't be our senses, because can we see something when we're not seeing it? 
No, so we can't believe, I, I don't believe my house is still here because I'm seeing it because I'm, I'm not seeing it. So we can't see their continued existence when we're not seeing them because that would be impossible. We have to see when we're not seeing them. Also, of course, we can't see them existing distinct from us when we're seeing them because we're seeing them. So we don't believe either of these because of our senses because that would be impossible. So next time, self and object. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on the first day in the future. Thank you.